I'm going to talk in this video about the threefold purpose of the soul winning scam. This whole thing of going out door to door, two by two, and, and inviting people to church and, and you know go, taking them through this little prepared uh, salvation, it never fails, I can get them with this every time kind of a presentation, little sales tactic that people do. What is, what's the point of this whole scam? Of course, I said it's about making money and people say, well, uh, I actually had some of the Anderson's people come along and saying, one guy said in particular, 99.9% .9 of their converts never show up at church. Uh, then you have a very high failure rate. Okay, but we're going to see what the scriptures say. But but I'm going to talk about the three reasons. And he said, he said this is ridiculous. You're saying that soul winning is about getting people into the church to get their money. Uh, that's just part of it. That's not the main purpose of the soul winning scam that is done by most modern Christians and things out there. Well, not, I shouldn't say most modern Christians, but a lot of the modern churches out there. Again, I'm not against the ministry of reconciliation, you know, preaching the gospel to lost. That's obviously a commandment for a Christian. I'm not against that. What I'm against is this, this new creation of this going out soul winning thing. And I'm going to show you why. Okay, what's the threefold purpose of this? Number one, to make yourself and your church, church look legitimate. Okay, that's one of the big reasons for it. Um, are you going to a good, good fundamental soul winning church? Is, are they soul winners there? No such term even appears in the New Testament. No Christian ever went soul winning. They take some you know, verse out of Proverbs that doesn't even relate to the thing of preaching the gospel to the lost. And they'll take this thing and they'll say, oh, well, see, you, got, you have to go soul winning. You have to be part of a soul winning church. So they try to legitimize themselves. And you'll see this with Jack Hiles. Jack Hiles is the one who really got this whole modern soul winning movement going. And, um, and you know, him, I mean, the guy was fornicating with his deacon's wife. He was, he was a raving pervert. He lied over and over again, contradicted himself, major, just heretic, but yet he was a soul winner. So, hey, we can forgive all the rest. You see? I'll get back to that, and, and that's kind of point number three, but we'll talk more about that in a minute. Number two, first of all, say it this way, to make yourself and your church look legitimate. That's reason number one. Number two, to increase giving to support your soul winning efforts. That's what I'm talking about here. That's the big money maker right there. Um, hey, we're going out. We had we led 2,000 people to the Lord. We've seen 10,000 people come to Christ within the last few years. We've seen that. We've seen, why? Legitimize yourself for the purpose of getting money from people. You see? Um, it's the same exact thing as multi-level marketing. Um, So-and-so just came along and he's selling our product now and he made $50,000 the first month. Um, this guy here, he went out and he, he got you know 500 people uh, in his first month to join our program here and now we're making lots of money and he's making lots of money and he's on his way to becoming one of the greatest salespeople that we have. That's what it's all about. Number three, to silence your critics who haven't won as many souls as you have. Yeah, and you'll see that with these heretics. I've dealt with them for many, many years. And you'll be talking to them about the Bible or whatever else and you'll bring up some point of doctrine where they're wrong and you start to confront them and they'll say, well, you, but let me ask you the question. When's the last time you led somebody to Jesus Christ, huh? When's the last time you won a soul to Jesus? They'll do that. You know, they'll put you down. You know, you say, well, I did, oh, I didn't think so. I win people to Jesus all the time. <laughs> okay, where are they? You know? Well, 99.9% .9 of them don't come to church, but I've, I've led them to the Lord. And what they do with their lives after I've, you know, convinced them through my little sales pitch well, that's not my fault. Really? Well, let's go to Acts chapter 2, the very first uh, big evangelistic movement um, after Jesus Christ went back up to heaven. Okay? The day of Pentecost, where you actually have a number reported. You're not going to see too many times where they're reporting the numbers that got saved and whatever else. But let's just go to the foundational one, the one that starts it all. Acts chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 37 through verse 47. Read along in your King James Bible. Don't just sit there watching me. Get your King James Bible and read along to make sure I'm not lying to you. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? 
Peter's been preaching to them. He didn't just go up and do his, you know, they weren't going out by twos and knocking on the Jews' doors. Okay, keep that in mind as we read this. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. No longer the gospel for today, by the way, I might add. This is a transitional book. All right, so you tell somebody to repent and be baptized. Um, it's not really the, the plan of salvation. That was later really revealed to Paul. And Peter later on confirms it. Um, that's another study. Verse 39, For the promise is unto you and to your children to, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this unto our generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So there you see a number. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they, continuing, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Okay, um, need to make a bunch of points here. First of all, uh, as I stated a little bit there at the beginning, this is public preaching. This is not personal evangelism. Okay? There's no, let's go out by pairs and let's go knock on doors and talk to people on the streets. And This is public preaching. Okay, that's point number one that you need to get. Number two, it says there in verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. There was conviction there. They used the sword of the Spirit to convict them. It wasn't just, if you died today, would you go to heaven? Um, would you like to know how you can go to heaven when you die? The Bible says that we're all sinners. We can all agree to that. And that and no, no, no. There was personal conviction. Peter's condemning them and saying, you killed the Lord. All right? You're wicked. You're sinful. He was convicting them. They were pricked in their heart. All right? uh, if there's no biblical repentance there, if there's no sorrow that's in somebody, they're not going to be getting saved, genuinely born again. They'll pray a prayer. They'll repeat this little thing and whatever else. But if there's no conviction there... Um, it's not going to take. It's just not going to happen. Uh, number three, notice it says there, uh, verse 37, uh, and to the rest of the apostles, and, and said unto Peter, sorry about that phone call over there, um, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Notice that. These people are, they're lost people and they're inquiring, how can I be saved? It isn't some kind of a thing where you've cornered them and you've intellectually got them into this little sales pitch that you have and they're saying, oh, I never, you know, I guess I should. I don't, they're, there's preaching being done to them and they're under conviction. They're pricked in their heart and answering machines going over there. I apologize about that. Um, it's funny. I quote scripture in the thing, in, in my answering machine thing, and they never quite get, quite get through that. <laughs> People, the telemarketers get, you know, they'll listen to a little bit of the scriptures that I quote and then they just hang up. But let me continue here. Okay. They're pricked in their heart and they say, what must we do? All right. Um, Acts chapter 16, another one of the favorites of the easy believism crowd. And they say, well, see, he didn't say anything about repentance or anything else. You know, he comes and says, uh, what must I do to be saved? And they say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And people say, well, see, there's no repentance there. Uh, yes, there was. Okay, the guy was going to kill himself, first of all. And Paul cries out, you know, do thyself no harm. But also, the guy comes and falls down at their feet and says, what must I do to be saved? We see the same thing here. They're pricked in their heart. They're convicted for their personal sins. And as a result, they're saying, what do I have to do to be saved? See, that's the true state of a broken sinner coming for salvation. They're looking for it. They're sick. They have problems. They understand, I'm a sinner. I, I, I want out of this life. I need something. I need help. And when they hear the gospel, they say, what do I need to do? What, I, I, 
Jesus died on the cross. What can I do? And they're, they're excited. They want, to, they want to be saved, you see. Number four, Peter exhorted with many other words there in verse 40. And with many other words did he testify and exhort. This isn't some kind of a quick little, well, you know, just give me five minutes of your time and I can show you from the Bible how to be saved, how to know for sure that you're going to go to heaven when you die. Please just repeat this prayer after me. Blah, 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 you know, uh-uh. With many other words. Let me ask you a question, you uh, great soul winning marathon type of people. Um, do you think the people that you talk to when you're out going door to door, and I used to do the same thing, so I know what the answer is to this, but I'll ask it to you. Um, do you think that they would be interested in, in hearing you preach for an hour or two? No. They come to the front door and they're stepping back and forth. Okay. Yeah. They don't want to be there listening to you. Most of the people I ever ran into, they were as you know as quick as they could get in there and just say, I, "I'm no, I'm not interested. No, no, thank you." You know, and then you get some that would just be you know kind of polite and try to hear you out and whatever else. Do you think that they'd really want to come to a public meeting someplace and sit there for hours and hear somebody preaching? I don't think so. But you see, you can make a lot more sales going door to door. But uh, verse 5, or yeah, verse 5. Number 5, the people gladly received his word. That's in verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. Okay? They're gladly receiving the word. Why? Because they want to hear how to be saved. They're not in this uncomfortable thing where you're there on their doorstep or you meet them on the street and you stop them from doing what they need to do and whatever else. They're gladly receiving it. You see? Big difference there. Um, again, you have 3,000 souls were, you know, about 3,000 souls there uh, were saved in verse 41. So that's another thing to consider. But uh, notice it doesn't say that uh, 3,000 souls were one, you know, to the Lord or whatever. It says added unto them. Um, but yet the soul winners out there, the soul dammers actually is what they are, they'll say, um, we don't really know for sure, we can't say for sure if these people genuinely got saved or whatever. Or, Well, I think that they did, but they just don't come to church or, or whatever. Uh, no, it's when these people got saved here, the 3,000 there, about 3,000 in verse 41, they were added unto them. They are there. They're part of them now. Okay? Understand that. They're in fellowship. We'll see that as we continue. Um, verse or uh, yeah, verse 42, point number seven here I've written out. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. The new converts continued in those things. Hmm. Again, it wasn't, well, we, they didn't really show up. We, I, I guess that they were real. or No, they're, they're there. They're part of it. Uh, verse 46. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Notice, by the way, it says, oh, see, house to house. Believers breaking bread. Believers fellowshipping together. It has nothing to do with going and knocking on doors. That's not a New Testament practice. You're not going to see that anywhere where they're out there knocking on doors telling people how to be saved. Show me one verse that says that. All right? It doesn't say it. All right? But again, they're, they're in fellowship. They're there. Uh, verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. The Lord added daily. Okay? That's not some kind of Calvinistic thing that he has pre-chosen the people and he's forcing them against their will to come and be saved because he's predestinated. No, no. It's just the Lord is the one who's controlling this whole thing. See, salvation is God's realm. It's not man's realm. It's not intellectual something up here that you can, you can kind of trick somebody into praying a prayer and, ha, I got you. You prayed the prayer, you're in. And they're saying, well, I didn't really understand. It doesn't matter. Okay, you're in. Sorry. You got in there. <laughs> I need your. I need to report your numbers there so I can make myself look really good. No, doesn't work that way. So just a real quick little study here, just to go over some of this stuff, this heresy of this soul winning scam stuff. Um, it it is 
I can't imagine much more or many things that are more vile than this because what they're doing is they're giving people a false sense of hope. They're giving people a false sense that they're saved when in reality they're not. And um, if you had to follow the soul winning people out there, if you had to follow the criteria say, set out here in Acts chapter 2, as far as going and preaching with many other words and testifying and whatever else, and then these people continuing with you and, and the whole thing there, and, and you, you're pricking them in the heart, uh, they're convicted and they're saying to you, what must I do to be saved? You wouldn't be able to get anybody saved nowadays. Maybe a few here and there, but you certainly wouldn't be reporting back all 30, 40, 50, 60 people in one event or something like this. No, you wouldn't. You would not. Not at all. So if you're involved in that thing, um, what's going to happen? I'm going to tell you right now what's going to happen. Um, you're going to burn out. It's going to wear you out eventually because you see, uh, you're supposed to be out there, you know, pounding the streets and, and knocking doors and and that's going to prove that you're a good, faithful Christian. And I used to do the thing every week. You know, you got to show up as early as you can. You have a little Bible study, and then you go out and you do the soul winning thing, and you come back and you give your reports and all this other stuff. Uh, I was involved in the thing. And after a while, it starts to get really tiring and, and very old. You know, and it's not because you're doing right and the flesh is fighting it. No, it's because you're doing wrong. And you're going out there, and all oh, we're seeing, we've seen hundreds of people saved. Where are they? They're not there. If you're for the church building thing and whatever else, these people should be coming. You get them, quote unquote, saved, they should be coming. But they don't. Why? Because they're not really getting saved. All right? So uh, let, your, let your standards come from here. All right? Um, that's very important. You're going to be judged by the standards of this book. All right? Make sure that you're right with the Lord.